You're listening to episode 115, From Bullied and Isolated to Helping Others Leave a Legacy, with Tina Dietz. Welcome to the Grass Gets Greener podcast, the show for survivors by survivors. I'm your host, Melissa Wilson, a bullying survivor and anti-bullying advocate. And each week you'll hear from a survivor who has overcome a traumatic experience to go on to not only survive, but thrive so that you can too, starting now. Hey there, welcome to this latest episode and thanks so much for tuning into it. Today we're going to be joined by Tina Dietz from Start Something Creative Business Solutions. Tina is a successful entrepreneur and speaker today, but she experienced some pretty bad bullying growing up, so I invited her onto the show to share her journey with us. If you have experienced bullying, then you could find what Tina shares in regard to her bullying experience uh, to be triggering, of course. While not triggered per se, I was able to relate to a lot of what she experienced. Now, I think this episode is a good listen, not just for someone who has been bullied, but for anyone who is trying to heal from a past hurt caused by others. Uh, In particular in this episode, Tina is going to talk about an experience she had when she was two years old that set her up to be hypervigilant and to not having a good relationship with authority and how that ended up following her into school. She's going to talk about how her bullying situation was handled or not handled at the time. Uh, She'll talk about how she tried to make herself less of a target. She'll share how her experience made her become really curious to understand human behavior and what causes people to act the way they do. She'll share the legacy that she's committed to leaving in this world. And she'll also share a story of how she received a letter from one of the boys who bullied her. Uh, Definitely an interesting story. And she'll also share the importance of surrounding yourself with the right people and some tips for how to go about doing that. So I don't have anything else to mention here, so uh, we'll go ahead and get into this one, and I'll go bring Tina on. Tina, welcome to the podcast, and thank you for joining me here today to share your story with us. It's my pleasure, Melissa. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So I came across your story on another podcast and saw that you had experienced bullying in school, but I know that you're doing well today as a a successful business owner and speaker, and so I wanted to have you on the show to share the journey that has led you to the life you have today and to provide hope and inspiration for those listening. And what I like to do, Tina, is to start at the beginning so that we have that backstory of where you're coming from and what you experienced, and then we'll go from there. Does that sound good to you? Sure. Yeah, we could definitely talk about that. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, just kind of give us a glimpse into what you experienced growing up. You know, let us know what happened, whatever you're comfortable sharing. Sure. Um, I actually think that even before I was bullied in school, there was a couple of incidents when I was very young. I was a very feisty kid. I was very outspoken from a very young age, as uh, a lot of us are as entrepreneurs. And one of the things that happened when I was very young, around two years old, is I was trying to stand up for a friend of mine who was actually being hurt by his mom. And of course, a two-year-old, a three-year-old doesn't really have any power. Right. (laughs) And that became a, a real difficulty for me at that age in wanting to protect my friend. I knew that something was wrong, but I couldn't. So I did the only thing I knew that I could do. And we were living in Southern California at the time. I ran away with him and I was going to take him to the castle at Disneyland. (laughs) And we were picked up by cops about five blocks from our house. (laughs) (laughs) So my my kind of inner justice system has been turned on and and tuned in for a very long time. But it was a it was a really difficult experience. It set me up for being um kind of hypervigilant and uh, not having a great relationship with authority. Mm. And uh, that kind of followed me into school later on. Gotcha. Yeah. And then, so when did the bullying begin in school? The bullying began in school around second grade. And looking back on it, and this is sometimes a controversial thing to say, but 
you know, this has been a lot of years of me working through this and uh, even being uh, asked to publish my experiences in a, in a book. Um, it's called uh, Unwavering Strength. And I can see where the person who was at the source of the bullying was in part reacting to his own insecurities around me. And of course, you know, at the time, you don't really analyze these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But what happened was, is that uh, I was very academically up there and, and doing very well, but socially, not so much. Uh, an only child, like I said, I was very outspoken. Also, just um, what today would probably be labeled as uh, highly sensitive in many ways. So the, that kind of combination of being uh, academically smart, but an only child and not socially um, maybe up to par mm -hmm. was was not great. And I had also started gaining weight at that time. So I was chubby, for lack of a better word. And, you know, it's kind of like I had a target painted on my head. So for most of what I remember from second grade, you know, they didn't have cooties. They had Tina germs. <laughs> and, uh, you know, on the playground, there were a couple of incidents where uh, it got out of hand. And the boys in playing their kind of military games decided that I was the enemy. And so they, you know, they had generals and lieutenants and all of that. And somehow I was the target for that. So I didn't really have any support or friends in the classroom because I was kind of, I was the cootie and it came to a head. It, you know, it was mostly isolation. I was also, because I was academically up there, I was in the only person in my reading group. I was the only person in my math group. So there really wasn't an effort by the administration to include me socially with the other students which today I could say probably would not happen, at least not in the experience I've had with my own kids, thankfully. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that just makes the situation worse, too, when you're mm -hmm. being isolated like that. Exactly. So a lot of isolation. There was also some, um, you know, incidences on the bus of hair pulling and physical violence um, and on the playground as well, where uh, at one point I went down the slide and I found myself surrounded by a group of kids and one kid kind of came in the middle and started punching me in the stomach. And, you know, I ran kind of screaming into the school and was basically told to stop overreacting and quiet down by the teachers. Mm. Yeah. No, I mean, thank you for sharing all of that with us. And yeah. I, I can relate to so much of that story in, in what I experienced. You know, I mean, I was, I'm an only child as well. And I was probably yeah, a little further along academically, but not quite where I needed to be socially. And I also was in situations where I was isolated and that made me more of a target. And so, yeah, I can, I can totally just sympathize with what you experienced growing up and understand how, how difficult and challenging it is to go through that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and it, it sounds like also you were being targeted by just a lot of the students was that there was kind of a group mentality you yeah. know there so the, the students that weren't actively participating were passively participating or concerned themselves about being labeled right exactly i mean i think what happens would you agree is that like you're either especially if you're targeting if there's one person you know kind of in your class that's being targeted like if you're not targeting them along with everyone else then you're making yourself vulnerable to becoming bullied as well. Yeah, it's it's very kind of wolf pack mentality where, you know, the 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 omega for better, you know, for for whatever reason it gets gets kind of targeted out and and really isolated. And um it wasn't until May, or my birthday's in May, and uh that it kind of came to a head and it did stop, but it stopped because on my birthday, you know, as you do, you bring in cupcakes and I was very proud of them. I'd made them completely by myself and handed them out and stood in front of the classroom and the teacher started singing happy birthday and no one joined in. Mm. And so I remember feeling as though I was, I felt like my, I was literally dissolving. Like, you know, the Wizard of Oz when the, when the witch melts at the end of the movie, <laughs> I thought, and I just, it was, it was 
And she finally figured out that something was very, very wrong. And the amazing thing was, is that it took one conversation between her and the boy that was kind of the uh, Erzett's ringleader of it. And, you know, he wasn't a bad kid. It had gotten out of hand. Um, And, you know, and then there's actually a follow up story to this many years later where uh, I got a letter from him. Oh, really? I can tell you about too. Yeah. Um, But it stopped. You know, it pretty much just stopped on a dime. And wait, and so what? What grade was this? Sorry, second second grade. Okay, second so this, grade. I mean, there were other, this took place yeah. just in second this grade. This is all mm-hmm. in one grade. Yeah, okay. mm-hmm. <laughs> it was all in one grade, and other things happened here and there. But it that experience really shaped how I interacted with other students from there on in, mm-hmm. and particularly shaped how I interacted with boys. Mm. Yeah, and were you able to? like tell anyone outside of school what was happening? Yeah, I had told my parents what was happening kind of throughout the year, but it, um, and I guess there had been some meetings that happened back then, you know, in the 19, early 1980s, you know, they, children weren't included in the process. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, your parents would come into school and you'd never know that they were in school. So I didn't actually even know that things were happening behind the scenes, but for some reason it never got back to somehow never really, the gravity of it never really made it through. There was, I think there was a lot of what we hear the, you know, boys will be boys or, you know, she's very sensitive or some of those excuses that we still hear. And, uh, you know, I know in my, it's one of the big things that drove me to become a therapist was to make sure that people's feelings didn't get discounted mm-hmm. the way they so, they so often can be. Mhm. Yeah. So now and then this was the only time that you had experienced bullying while you were in school. The rest no. of the years were okay. Uh, no. No. Oh. <laughs> no. No, no. No, it was never systematic like that again. But I spent a lot of time on the outside, on the fringes. You know, there were you know, years even in third and fourth grade where Oh God, the stupid Valentine's Day. I mean, really, let's just ban the damn thing. Oh, uh, no. And and that's when it was, you know, people would only bring in Valentine's to the people they felt like they were friends with. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you'd get one or two from the kids whose parents knew better and sent Valentine's in for every single child in the classroom. Mm-hmm. And then that would be it. And you just sit there and you're like... Okay, yeah. is anyone else going to give me one? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. So I, I learned how to cope and to lean on my own strengths intellectually and also as a performer um, to kind of carve out a space for myself and and carve out a space where I could feel safer. And as I got older, um, things started to even out because there were some other students who then came up to the same level I was academically and I wasn't so isolated and the conversations got richer. And so, and and I learned, like I said, you know, my, my strategy with boys went from kind of trying to meet them head on, um, you know, and be just as kind of loud as they were to, um, pursuing them, you know, and trying to play a more sexually manipulative role. So that switched and became a whole other animal in high school. Mm. Yeah. And then as you, you know, as you got out of school, I mean, did you find that you were still being affected by what you experienced? You know, looking back on it, uh, one of the things that the experience really spurred me to do was to seek out help. And I wanted to find out why, like what would really spur a group of 12 year olds to suddenly form a ring around another random student for no particular reason and start chanting names at them, hurtful names. Like what, Mm. what even causes something like that? Yeah. So so you were just really, you were just really curious to find out why this happened, why people act this way. Mm -hmm. So I actually sought out, um, First, the school guidance counselor, and in middle school, I was really fortunate to have a good one. And the later on, actual therapist to to work on that, as long as some other things too, some you know, some family patterns and whatnot. And then, 
you know, studied psychology in college and eventually became a therapist, which is not my primary business today, but it was the foundation for me of really understanding what makes people tick. Why do people make the decisions they do? What causes different kinds of behavior, whether it's leadership or um, violence or whatever the case may be? Why do people act in, in, the, in the ways that they do? And I, that's a lifelong fascination for me. Mm. Um, did you find it, it, it helped you to study that? Yes, it did. It did actually, because it helped me have more competency to deal with my own reactions, my own feelings. We can't control others, but we can have responsibility, accountability, and, and to a certain extent, control of our own reactions and our own feelings. And so my personal development journey started very young in my teen years and then continued on after I got out of high school, I started seeking out uh, leadership training, communication training, all of that. And, and now, you know, I'm on the opposite end of that. I deliver those type of programs and I help to create leaders. And, uh, but the underlying part of that for me is always to reach people so that they're bringing their fulfillment, their enlightenment, their happiness, their purpose back home to the next generation, back home to their community, so that people have a space of feeling valued and feeling purpose. And so that's the legacy that I'm really committed to leaving. Mm, that's awesome. Now, when you were, you know, experiencing the bullying, mm -hmm. did you ever try, I mean, because this is something that, that I did, um, did you ever try to, like, make yourself invisible or you know, make yourself less of a target in some way? I didn't try to make myself invisible. I tried to make myself someone else. I would actually, uh, books have been one of my best friends, still are, since I was started reading when I was, you know, two, three years old. And so I would escape into the stories. I would think about being those characters and I would, you know, almost kind of try to pretend to be who they were to draw on their strength, their characteristics. And, uh, it, it helped. It did mm. help. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. I mean, I think I definitely tried to, to take the approach of, you know, being more I invisible or less of a target. Um, and to some extent, I also did try to become someone else, you know, try, I think in, in the process of trying to uh, become less of a target, I tried to, to make myself to be someone who, you know, that they wanted me to be right, so that so that I would be less of a target to them. Um, That's a very good point. Yeah. Do you feel like did did you you know taking the approach that you did in, in trying to to be someone else? Did you find that that made you confused later on when you were trying to you know trying to be yourself in the world? Yeah, I think it actually created a lot of confusion around relationships. Um, I had mentioned that, you know, high school was a, a very different scenario. And what I tried to do to make sure that I didn't end up a target was I basically just tried to not make any mistakes, mm. just not so much academically, because I, you know, that was always kind of easy for me, but socially to try to be friends with everyone, to try to be the peacekeeper or mediator. Um, when there were parties and things like that, I was the person who was the designated driver. I would be the ones that if something went down, I was the one talking to the cops. Um, and I would often draw away dangerous situations from my friends and take them on myself. Um, kind of like a, well, maybe I can be the savior or the protector in some way. And that led to it's a fair amount of self abuse and some mm -hmm. really lousy decision making and, um, you know, being hurt in a, in a number of ways, uh, that, you know, later on I had to go kind of go back and come to terms with and work through. Mm -hmm. Now you said that you received a letter from the person who bullied you. Yeah. Yeah. Now, it was tell really, us, tell us about that. It was quite extraordinary. So like I said before, this, this little boy, you know, he wasn't a bad kid. Um, and I, and I, we were never friends, so I can't really speak to what he might've been going through at the time, but you know, he, we didn't travel in the same circles through school, but 
years later, he ended up marrying one of my best friends from school. And I remember before they got married, she came to me and she said, you know, I know you had some issues in the past. And I, was, I had done a lot of work <laughs> therapy by then and had some perspective. I was like, look, you know, that was a long time ago. And, you know, is he a good man? You know, does he treat you well? I'd never, you know, seen any, you know, issues of him being abusive or anything like that. She said, no, of course not. And, you know, and they've been married for 20 years now. Mm -hmm. But uh, a bunch of years ago, I had actually just been doing some work, some deep completion work with a therapist and some of the old stuff had come back up. Some, some things around, you know, I was being, getting on stages and developing my, my speaking platform and all of that. And it had some old body memory, some twinges, some concerns about getting up in a group of people and, you know, even though I've been performing for years, there's a difference when you're getting up and acting on stage, when you're getting up and really sharing a story or when you're training and being a leader. It's a different level of vulnerability. So I had done a bunch of work with that and done some additional forgiveness work. And uh, I had a party uh, at, a, at a restaurant, a cocktail party. And um, my friend and her husband, who had been this boy, were there and at one point, he just kind of put this letter into my hand. He goes, don't read it now. Don't read it later. Okay. And it was like this, I don't know, two or three page letter hmm. asking me to forgive him. Wow. And he had become, <laughs> I get so moved by this. He had become an English teacher. And I know he's a really good teacher. Hmm. And one of the things that he is committed to and continues to be committed to is making sure that the children in his class do feel included and they don't get bullied. Oh, that's great. And that came out of his experience. So it's, you know, in terms of the best possible outcome I could have hoped for, <laughs> that's the best possible outcome I could have hoped for. Mm. So, and I know not everybody's story ends like that. Um, the only piece of it that I was a little bit sad about was in the letter, he wasn't really open to having a conversation and he felt like a bad person and didn't want me to discuss it with his wife, my friend. And I just wanted to tell him, listen, your wife already knows all this. You're not <laughs> a bad person. You know, she loves you anyway. You were seven. It sucked. And, you know, and I'm, and I'm, but I'm glad the person you've become is not that scared kid. Mm -hmm. You know, however, however that, that was for you. Yeah. Um, and that he took his leadership potential and put it into something good. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. That's great. So you haven't talked to him since then? No, no. I see him on Facebook. But. <laughs> 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 you know, I asked if he was open to a conversation at the time and he didn't respond, but um, yeah. it's okay. You know, everyone's yeah. got their own journey. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like, I mean, the letter helped you to to get some closure on that. Yeah, it was so funny because I was like, I had felt so much closure. And then there was this like little piece that just kind of came out of nowhere. And for me, um, you know, taking it into a bit of a woo-woo stance, you know, a little, little existential bit, I felt as though it was kind of confirmation that I really had done the work and gotten complete because somehow it had ricocheted back mm -hmm. and, and made a bigger difference. Yeah. And, and like you said, I mean, not everyone is going to have that happen. You know, mm -hmm. we're not going to find ourselves in that situation. And I, I think it's important to, you know, find a way to to be able to get that closure without that, you know. And, and just like they say, you know, when it comes to forgiving people, I mean, forgiveness is for us. It's not for them, you know. So we have to do what we need to do for ourselves to be able to heal and to move past it, regardless of, of whether or not, you know, we hear from the person who hurt us and, and they apologize, you know? Absolutely. Um, my, my dear friend and colleague, Sean Duperin is the founder of Project Forgive, which if you're not familiar with, is just an extraordinary organization that reaches millions of people. And it's really about forgiveness education and, and forgiveness is a process and she has this wonderful body of work around accepting the apology you'll never receive. Mm. And it's very, very powerful. And it's a process. Yeah. No, I, I haven't heard of them. I'll have to check that yeah. out. And yeah. Very cool stuff. Cool. Um, so I know you've talked about how, you know, therapy has 
played a big role in your healing. Um, Mm -hmm. Other things that you want to mention that have helped you to get to where you are today? Oh, wow. Um, It, you know, being a, becoming a therapist myself, I had access to a lot of different modalities. So it's not just a matter of, of going through different, the healing process or, you know, traditional psychotherapy, you really have to find what works for you. And there's so much available out there and it can be a little bit overwhelming, but you know, I am, I'm very visual. I have a fantastic imagination and I, being a storyteller myself, it's always been really helpful for me to work with modalities where I can visualize things like inner family work, um, or, uh, the soul sync process, which is an emerging modality, um, out of Australia. Um, and things like that, or even hypnotherapy or EMDR, where you really start to be able to rewire the brain because some these things leave a mark. They leave a neurological mark just as much as they leave an emotional mark. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we have to work with the biology and the neurology as much as we have to work with the feelings that come up or the thoughts that come up because they're all connected together. So I find it extremely empowering to know that I'm if I work with the, the mechanisms of, of what was left behind from the bullying, then that's also going to have an impact on my well-being and my mental state and, and all of that. I think one of the, the, the lessons I can still continue to learn are really around self-care and allowing myself to take the time and the energy to put myself first. Mm-hmm. So important. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, so kind of on that note, um, I mean, how are you doing today? And are there, are there things you're still, you still struggle with from what you went through? Yeah. I mean, I don't know if it's so much, it's hard to say, well, this is from this, right. You mm-hmm. know, so this, we're, have this mass of experiences and, um, besides the, the childhood bullying, I had some other experiences with abuse, of varying kinds growing up. And, all of these things, you know, they leave a mark. And after a while, I I remember thinking when I was very, very young, that I had been born defective in some way. And that conversation was one of the most beliefs that belief really was one of the most powerful ones that I ever undertook kind of calling into question and shifting and changing. And yet, you know, we're the sum of our experiences and our, and our past. And sometimes it feels like you're reliving an old pattern or it feels like I'm reliving something from the past. And that now has become a red flag for me. It's like, wait a minute, if this feels really familiar, then, you know, what piece of the past is showing up right now? What old pattern or old belief is showing up right now? So much of growth and development and healing is in n- not so much in erasing what happened but in actually developing internal systems so that you can recognize when an old pattern or an old belief is popping up and then you can dismantle it quickly rather than allowing it to go down a rabbit hole Mm -hmm. and those coping mechanisms and those, uh, and also, you know, who do you surround yourself with? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm an extrovert (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) and for me, I'm always in a process of, well, for lack of a better word, collecting people, collecting good people, you know, so trying to surround myself with wonderful, amazing people and sharing with them. Because if your environment reflects something that's really healthy and really helps you grow, then when things, when the crap does hit the fan, it's a lot easier because your environment is already there to support you. So when they say, oh, surround yourself with like-minded people who are going to raise you up, they ain't kidding. Yeah. It's really important. It's really important to get in communication when you're feeling like dirt Mm -hmm. or you're feeling like the world is against you to get in communication about that and not to stay hidden out in your own space. Because the more we allow ourselves to connect with other people, because we're such social beings, the more we can kind of readjust ourselves and get back on course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Because, um, yeah, I mean, things can come up, we can get triggered, and it's about being equipped to 
to deal with them so that they don't spiral out of control as they may have in the past. Um, how do you go about, you know, I, I know, like, like you said, I mean, it's so true that it's important to surround yourself with like-minded people and people who are going to support you and lift you up. Um, and maybe, you know, some people listening feel like they don't have much of a support system and they don't know how to get one. Um, how do you go about, you know, finding people who fall into that category for you? Yeah, that, um, <laughs> well, this isn't necessarily for everybody, but, uh, I have a, a, a very severe case of what I like to call happy puppy syndrome. And <laughs> what that means is basically that I get very enthusiastic about a lot of things that I'm excited about. And it could be anything from an author that I love, a television show to, uh, you know, a topic like leadership or, um, karaoke for goodness sake, right. Or, or hobbies of any kind. I tend to look, uh, for people where it's easiest to find them. So, so for example, we just moved to a new, new area and I, I don't know anybody here. So what I decided to do was be proactive and start reaching out to people, uh, through meetup.com. Uh, I found groups that I'm interested in topics that I'm interested in and just started putting in my calendar, going out to meet people through these different groups, just to not even business networking. Like I have one that's, that's even a, like a, a knitting group and I'm not a very good knitter, but, um, you know, there's a book club, there's, you know, some other things just to start to feel out, you know, what's available here, where are the people, um, going to music events where a, a lot of times I find that people who like the same kind of music, sometimes you end up, you know, meeting people that way. Um, and also, um, you know, through business as well. I mean, a lot of my close friends and close colleagues I have met through either personal and professional training development uh, events or through organizations. Um, I'm a member of the Evolutionary Business Council, which is a global organization uh, that helps uh, empower leaders and leadership and is causing transformation in the world. And so that's really become my business family, my business tribe. And uh, I'm continually meeting people uh, through that association. So it's kind of picking an area where something that you're passionate about and, and starting to find other people who are, who kind of feel the same way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it comes down to having to put yourself out there. It does. Yeah. Which I know is not always, you know, comfortable for people. Um, but it's unfortunately how I have to go about it. And I don't know. I mean, I find that like the more I do it, the more comfortable it gets anyways. Yes, that's very true. And some folks, that's one of the reasons that social media has helped a lot of people because they've been able to interact without having to physically show up somewhere. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's easier place for someone to, to start yeah. to have those conversations. Yeah. And I think meetup.com is a great place to go. Um, if you're looking to meet up with people in person and find new groups of people to get uh, involved in. It's also great, you know, and like you said, it doesn't have to be related to business. I mean, it can just be related to hobbies or, or anything that you like doing. Um, because if you're going to a group where you're with other people who enjoy the same thing that you enjoy, then you're going to find those, those like-minded people. Um, and I think it's also great, like if someone uh, is a dog owner, you know, there's so many dog groups out there. And that's oh, yeah. a, a great place to, to get started and to meet people. And at least you kind of, you know, you have your dog to help you break the ice. So it's not as, uh, as uncomfortable, I think. So, yeah, I think the, those are some Dogs great Dogs are excellent tips. facilitators. Yes. Mm, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> In so many ways. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, so, Tina, tell us, um, you know, more about what it is you do today. What I do today is I work with leaders and authors and entrepreneurs, and people who are experts in their fields, to help them be more effective in getting their voice and their message out to a bigger audience. And I do that through podcasting, for one, for, through audiobooks and audiobook production, and also through developing thought leadership marketing strategies 
with folks. So everything that I do is really about causing leaders, causing leadership in the world and helping people to get their voice out to thousands or millions of people where they can make a difference and, and leave, leave the legacy they want to leave. So that's what I'm privileged to do every day. Awesome. Yeah. And I know you mentioned a book earlier that you were a part of called um, Unwavering Strength. Yeah. Yeah. I looked into that as I was preparing for this call and it, it just, it looks like an awesome book. Um, tell us a little more about that. Well, I was, uh, it was actually through this organization, organization I mentioned, the Evolutionary Business Council, that uh, I had uh, met the the publisher and she was collecting stories and wanted to tell the stories of people who had overcome some very difficult things and, you know, insurmountable odds or, you know, difficult situations. And she had collected this incredible range of stories, but she had been unable to find someone who was willing to have a conversation about childhood bullying. And I offered up my story and, uh, she very graciously accepted it into the book. And I was, I was very proud and very privileged to, to be able to tell that story along with people who had done everything from, you know, dealt with the loss of a child to escaped from um, a country as a, as a refugee. Like, uh, I remember one of those stories, was just amazing. And everything in between. Um, and so I believe that there are several Unwavering Strength books now, the the anthologies, and there's also been some audio programs and and different things around it, because it's, you know, something that every human on some level can relate to is having to overcome something um, that has left them <clears throat> maybe with a mark, but also with additional strength. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll have that linked up on the show notes page. I think the audience will be interested in checking that out. Um, so, Tina, I want to ask you the uh, final question that I have for you today. Mm -hmm. And that is, given what you know now, if you could go back to when you were going through your tough times and give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be? <laughs> I actually think I would go back to myself at that age and say, you know what, you think you're too loud, but you actually can be louder. It's totally fine to go and hold grown-ups to what they need to do to protect you. And don't stop. Don't stop standing up for yourself. Don't stop saying no. And uh, don't stop telling because you deserve to be safe and you deserve to have a great school experience as well. And you know what? It's all going to work out. Great advice. I love it. And before I let you go, uh, how can people, you know, find out more about you or connect with you? Probably the best way to reach me is uh, through my podcast, The Start Something Show. So you can go to thestartsomethingshow.com and check out episodes and the other work that I do with leaders there and happy to connect. All right. Sounds good. I'll have that linked up on the show notes page as well. And Tina, just thank you for coming on here today and for sharing your story. Uh, and I think it's really inspiring and, and hopeful. Um, you know, so just thank you for, for what you do and, and for sharing what you've been through. Um, I appreciate it. Well, thank you for creating this show. So people can can share and know that they're not alone. Absolutely. All right. Well, I hope you have a great rest of your day. You too. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the show today. This has been the Grass Gets Greener podcast, episode 115. Go to thegrassgetsgreener.com forward slash Tina D to find the links mentioned during this episode or to leave a comment. So I hope you enjoyed this episode and enjoyed hearing Tina's story. I just want to reiterate what we were talking about toward the end in regard to surrounding yourself with the right people. They say we are the average of the five people we spend the most time with. So it is important to make sure we're surrounding ourselves with people who are supporting us and helping us to grow rather than people who may be holding us back. It's okay to stop associating with people like that or at least have, you know, boundaries with them. It's your life and you get to decide who's going to have an influence over it. So that's my thought for this episode. Come back in two weeks for the next episode. And also head over to the website to grab your free copy of the top 10 strategies guide for survivors. 
In it, you'll find the top 10 most common strategies my podcast guests have used for overcoming the effects of past trauma. It's a great place to get started if you're looking for some strategies that can help you in your healing as they have helped my guests. And you can find that at thegrassgetsgreener.com forward slash guide or also on the show notes page. So be sure to grab that if you haven't yet. And lastly, don't forget to head over to iTunes or Stitcher to leave the show rating and review so that we can reach as many survivors as possible. And as always, have hope.